Glory to the King. Welcome back. Hey, um, Troy, we got a storm moving in here, so be aware. And hey, I want to uh, give you a pat on the back, Troy, because you've been rocking us out on those breaks. I'm really enjoying the music that you've been playing. Rock on, brother. Very cool. Okay, let's get back into our study. We're in Ezekiel chapter 39, and we are at verse 24, or 23, is it? Yeah, tr yeah, 23. And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity, because they trespassed against me. Therefore hid I my face from them. See, he's blinded them to the identity of the Messiah. And gave them into the hand of their enemies. So fell they all by the sword. Now when the temple is defiled. The Jews have to flee. And those who can't flee. It says let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. But those who can't flee. Are going to uh, either take the mark. Or they're going to be killed. Okay. According to their uncleanness. And according to their transgressions. Have I done unto them and hid my face from them? He has not allowed them to know the identity of the Messiah. He's, he's kept it from them all this time. And it is for, it is, it is for a purpose. Okay. Um, he's hidden himself from them to reach out to the Gentiles. But then in this. Daniel's 70, 70th week in this final half, he's going to be opening their eyes. It says that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. All right. The fullness of the Gentiles comes in when Jesus gets here. He evacuates all those who have trusted in him raising the dead in Christ and taking them too. They'll be alive. He raises them like Lazarus. They'll be alive too and we'll all go together. But Israel stays. Those who trust in the law rather than in the Messiah. The law cannot save you. Keeping You can't keep the law perfectly, no matter how hard you try. So it's you must have the blood of the Messiah. Apply to your account or your toast. Okay. Now, um, one second. Now, let's keep going. Verse 25. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel. And will be jealous for my holy name. So they're going to be captives one more time. Okay. Uh, after that. And now that's. It, it's not Russia that captures them. It's the West. The Antichrist. Who forces the mark down everyone's throat. Pope Francis. The snake in a dress. Okay. Uh, in verse 26, after that, they have borne their shame and all their trespasses, whereby they have trespassed against me when they dwelt safely in their land and none made them afraid, even though God has done the miraculous and brought them back to their land and they've dwelled there in safety. They still have not turned to him. When I have brought them again from the people and gathered them out of their enemies lands and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations. Then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land and have left none of them any more there. Neither will I hide my face any more from them. For I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. How about it? So he is going to show them as the Gentiles are evacuated that, that believe in God and trust the Messiah. 
The blindness is removed from Israel at that point. And he will not hide his face anymore from them. And he will pour out his spirit upon the house of Israel. Okay, so they're going to know who he is. Now, we're going to go straight into chapter 40. This is where the new temple is built. All right. In the five and twentieth year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, in the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth year after that, the city was smitten. In the selfsame day, the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me thither. So this is a previous uh, captivity. All right. In the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain by which was as the frame of a city on the south. And he brought me thither and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass, like a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed. And he stood at the gate and the man said unto me, son of man, behold with thine eyes and hear with thine ears and set thine heart upon all that I shall show thee. For to the intent that I might show them unto thee, art thou brought thither. Um, hither, excuse me, hither. Declare all that thou seest to the house of Israel. And behold, a wall on the outside of the house was round about, and in the man's hand a measuring reed of six cubits long, by the cubit and a hand breadth. So he measured the breadth of the building, one reed and the height, one reed. And he came unto the gate, which looketh toward the east. This is verse six and went up the stairs thereof and measured the threshold of the gate, which was one reed, one reed broad blah, 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 and the other threshold of the gate, which was one reed broad. And every little chamber was one reed long and one reed broad and behold and between boy that's a tongue twister and between the little chambers were five cubits and the threshold of the gate by the porch of the gate was within one reed within was one reed so he's what he's doing is he's measuring the temple for the temple okay he measured also the porch of the gate within one reed. Then measured he the porch of the gate eight cubits and the post thereof two cubits. And the porch of the gate was inward. And the little chambers of the gate eastward were three on this side, three on that side. They three were of one measure and the posts had one measure on this side and on that side. So he's just, he's describing how the temple is to be laid out. And he measured the breadth of the entry of the gates, 10 cubits and the length of the gate, 13 cubits. The space also before the little chambers was one cubit on this side. And the space was one cubit on that side. And the little chambers were six cubits on this side and six cubits on that side. So uh, really it would be optimal if we had a diagram that we could show how all this is plotted, but that's not the lesson today. So he measured then the gate from the roof of one little chamber to the roof of another. One breadth was five and 20 cubits door against door. He made also posts of three score cubits, even unto the post of the court around about the gate. And from the face of the gate of the entrance into the face of the porch of the inner gate were 50 cubits. So this is all precisely plotted out. You could come up with blueprints from this information. And there were narrow windows to the little chambers and to their posts within the gate round about and likewise to the arches and windows were round about inward and upon each post were palm trees. Uh, it sounds beautiful, doesn't it? When brought he me into the outward court and lo, there were chambers and a pavement made for the court round about 30 chambers were upon the pavement and the pavement by the side of the gates over against the length of the gates was the lower pavement. Then he measured the breadth from the forefront of the lower gate 
unto the forefront of the inner court without a hundred cubits eastward and northward. Now, uh, then from 20 through uh, 37, you have location and the size of the gates. You have from 31 to 37. Well, wait a minute. No, that, excuse me, from 38 to 49, you've got the porch and its furnishings. Chapter 41, you've got the temple and its walls. And this, then in 42, you've got the priest's chambers. 43, the Lord's glory fills the temple. And in 4313, you have the size and the use of the altar. And then in 44, you have the use of the temple. Okay. Now, um, I know that's a lot. We're not going to go through all of that. But notice the sequence of events. It may be that the temple is not built until after we leave. It's possible. That's the sequence in Ezekiel. We'll just have to see how this goes. Um, does anybody have any questions? Let me go over here and see if anybody has any questions. Oh, Oh, you like the show tonight? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's it's the king's thing. It's his thing. Um, let's see. Why does God? I can't tell because what is it? What are you saying there, Janine? Oh. <laughs> oh, why is God seen in the eyes of some Jews, Messianic Jews, and not the rest? Um, those who love God, love the God of Abraham with their heart and they honor him in their heart and in their mind and in, and they seek to follow the law. They, it's, it's a heart thing rather than a head thing. See, the law is a head thing, but if you love God, you respect God, then he shows you the truth. But most Jews are secular and the ones that aren't um, are following the law. It's a head knowledge uh, without the heart knowledge. Just like I saw a video one time of a rabbi, a rabbi, okay, who was walking through this old city of Jerusalem and someone spoke to him and said, Jesus is coming. The rabbi turned around and said, I hope so, and I'll kill him myself. <laughs> that was what he said. That's how the, they, they hate Jesus. They, and they hate him without cause. And that's really interesting. It's, the prophecy says, and they hated me without a cause. There is not one king of Israel that they hate like that. And did you know that Jesus was the biological rightful heir to the throne on both sides. He's just, Joseph's family was descended from Solomon, his adopted father. Okay. Mary, from where his genetics came from, is descended from Nathan, son of King David. So see, he is, he was the biological and rightful heir to the throne when he was here. That's why they tried to make him king. He, he was the, the heir, the true heir. And there is not one single king of Israel, even the bad ones that the Jewish people hate, except for Jesus Christ. And if you ask them why they hate him, they can't tell you. They have no reason. It says in the word, they hated me without a cause. They hate him without cause. Okay. And so they can't really tell you why they hate him. They don't know. They just do. Okay. They just do. And it's because they're disobedient. 
You know, they look all holy on the outside, but behind closed doors, they're devils. Okay? And God has not shown them the identity of his son. But there is a remnant who is one third who will recognize the Messiah. And that I mean, and they will know who he is because this is ultimately, I mean, it's far less than that as far less than one third as we go into uh, these end time events, you know, but anyway, does anybody have any questions? I want to, uh, I want to answer whatever you have. Now, this puts an interesting spin on our, on my theory because, and I've been thinking about this real hard. Let me run some of my latest, you know, brainstorming past you. Now I've got more theories. Okay. Now they do end up with the same time for Jesus to come, but it changes thing, other events. OK, to to consider these. Now, one thing that I have, I just dis I've discovered myself. I have an error, I think, in my theory that I've identified, which would be the 56 years that we added to. We had 56 years remaining on Daniel's 70 weeks when the clock started again in 1967. Well, I added those 56 years and I got 2023, June, right? I made an error because I'm using, I, I, it didn't occur to me that the, uh, I used timeanddate.com to come up with, you know, these answers. Because they'll they'll add dates, you know, how many dates, how many days is, you know, if you add this many days to this date, what would the date be and all that? You can figure all that out at timeanddate.com. But what I should have done was consider the Jewish calendar on that calculation in particular. That's Daniel's 70 weeks. So what I needed to do was take 50... 360 days a year times 56 years. And that is 20,160 days. Now, if you add 20,160 days to um, June 5th, 1967, you get August 15th, 2022 not June 2023. So that, uh, I, I'm going to fix that error. Um, so the end of the generation is actually August 15th, 2022. Uh, that's my bad. Okay, sorry on that. But it looks like, let's go backwards. If you go backwards from that point, three and a half years, it comes to um, December, I believe, of 2018, okay, which means it can't, the blood moon in January 2019 can't be the one because there's not three and a half years left. So it does have to be the blood moon that, for the sixth seal that we already identified in June, uh, July 27th, 2018. That would open the sixth seal. Jesus would show up in September. And then you, but see, you've got just a little bit more. There's 99 days in there between, um, between the two. And I think, that 99 days could be how much he shortened it. Okay. So now remember that would be the very end of the generation. There's uh, back it up, back up August 15th, 2022 by three and a half years, get December 
2018. And we see the sixth seal, blood moon, July 27th, 2018. And six weeks later, after that seal opens, Jesus shows up in the sky. Last Trump, Feast of Trumpets, September 2018. But see, we won't know the day and the hour until we get to that point. And the priests see the new moon and declare the feast started. That's why you can't know the day or the hour ahead of time. But we can we can know the month and the year. Okay. It's, and this still affirms, you know, my theory where uh, of when the sixth seal opens. But it does change things on the back end. Now you've got... If you take, oh, I'm sorry, wait, uh, I didn't subtract it by three and a half years. I subtracted 815 of 2022 minus 1,335 days. See, the second half has got 1,335 days in it. And that comes to December 19th, 2018. Okay. There's 99 days difference, and that may be what he has that may be how much he has shortened it. But I, and see during that time, there's no more Russia, no more Muslims, no more haters of Israel. They think the Pope is their Messiah, but the faithful won't take the mark. Okay. The faithful will not take the mark, but we have also uh, something else I was going to show you, which is very interesting that I'm still looking at, actually. I, I'm, I'm constantly uh, brainstorming here, okay? Now, one thing I thought was really interesting, but it's, it's, it's projected on the 365-day calculation, which would be June, which was June 5th, 2023. Remember that one? Do you know if you if you subtract 1,335 days from that date right there, it's October 9th of 2019. And that is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, <laughs> lands d directly on it. So uh, that's a... Uh, that's something else I'm going to have to figure out in all of this. <laughs> we just got a couple of minutes. Uh, <laughs> do you guys have any other questions? Thank you, Janine and Shirley. Shirley said, wow, this is a really good show tonight. And Janine said, it's always a good show, don't you think? Thank you, guys. God be praised in all things. He's wonderful. And it's important, I think, for us to go through these things. Um because it's scary to see 40 million Russians in Moscow in their bunkers. And it's not just in Moscow. It's every major city in Russia from October 4th through the 7th, which is right now. This is October 4th. Uh, it's got people scared that this could be when everything blows up while they've got their people safely in their bunkers. Okay. that. But it's, that's why the Lord says wars and rumors of wars. It's not time for that war yet. But thank God we've got some time. So don't, don't worry that everything's going to blow up in our faces right away. It's not going to according to the word. Okay? Because it remember when it says in Ezekiel 38... Verse 18, it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel that his fury comes up in his face. That's when the wrath occurs. Okay. So it, the, the war, it, Russia is going to be moving toward Israel when God shows up. And, and so that's the timing. So he'll, uh, you know, they'll start amassing um, when the seal is opened probably, or maybe before. And then they'll move against Israel very close to when Jesus shows up. He's going to show up and intervene and save the day. Okay. But that's, uh, that's second half. And then when he comes, we are evacuated. So we're never going to see this war. Okay. Not this one. And so that's good news, isn't it? 
Very, very good news. Glory to the King. Okay, guys. Uh, praise the Lord. Thank you for joining me today. Um, I hope you have uh, an easier heart after learning these things about the timing of when to expect these wars. You don't worry about it blowing up in our face any day now. But should the Lord tarry, we'll see you. Well, it'll be Thursday, won't it? We don't do a show on Wednesdays. It'll be on Thursday, here, there, or in the air. And remember, do right and risk the consequences.